everyone to the second evening in the Literacy Live series. Tonight, I want to welcome John Cardillo. He's a local filmmaker, photographer, and activist. John is going to spend the next hour helping us figure out how to use our passions, in his case, film and photography, to help affect social change in our community. We want to thank also the town of Collingwood and experience Simcoe County for making this evening possible, as well as Fifth Street Creative and the Collingwood Youth Center. And I think that's all that I have to say, John. I'm going to let you take over and just go go mute. But if you need me for anything, I'm right here. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Caitlin. So my name is John Cardillo Jr. And uh, as Caitlin said, I am a photographer, a filmmaker, um, and an all around cool guy from the local Collingwood area. Now, I didn't grow up in Collingwood, but uh, we can get onto that more soon. Uh, the title of my piece is Can Art Change the World? which seems like a, a big question and, and you know, how does it relate to people in Collingwood? Well, we first want to go ahead and uh, actually define the word world because that's really important, right? It can be somewhat abstract and be a very big term. What does that mean? But really when it comes down to it, the world is just a fancy way of saying those around you. So, that brings us into me. Who am I? As I said, I'm John Carrillo Jr. I'm a filmmaker, I'm a photographer, I'm an activist. Um, I'm, a, I'm someone who cares a lot about Collingwood, let's say. First, I'm just gonna show you some of my photography uh, for no reason other than I couldn't find another place to put it in this uh, piece. So you should follow me on Instagram. This is my cheap plug. I would really like it if you would follow me on Instagram. That would mean a lot. All right, so now we're gonna go and talk about my work. First of all, what I did in uh, 2018 when I was in grade 11, along with a, a group of friends, we put together a feature length film uh, that was youth written, it was youth produced, everyone in it was under the age of 18 who put it together, we released that and we raised money for my friend's house. This was my first foray into filmmaking and it was something that was fun, but I, I started to feel that, that the arts and, and film was potentially a passion of mine. Now I'm gonna get to what I did in 2019, but first I'm gonna show what I did actually most recently, along with some good friends of mine who are very talented photographers, Emma Thornwell and Caden Culver. We worked with the Collingwood Youth Center to put together Hughes Magazine. It's a 200 page magazine with artwork featuring youth under the age of 25 who are all emerging artists. It's very good. And if you would like to know more, feel free to ask. And I have a link at the very end of the presentation if you'd like to purchase one yourself. Now, we're gonna move on to the main thing that I'm gonna be talking about relating to me, which is No Home in Sight. Now in 2019, we had begun the idea of making a second film, a, se a sequel to Senior Year. We didn't know what to do. We had many ideas. And we were working with the Collingwood Youth Center to make this happen. Lee Pankers of the Collingwood Youth Center brought to my attention that there was a youth homelessness issue in our community. And maybe we wanted to, to explore that. What started off as a short 15 minute film about, you know, a documentary about youth homelessness turned into an hour and 45 minute, very long, very, very um, emotionally, uh, jarring at times film for many people. The reason that is is because homelessness anywhere is something that goes unseen usually, but specifically in Collingwood, it's a small town, you don't see it. We raised money to help go to an emergency fund that the Collingwood Youth Center set up. All the things on screen you're seeing now were part of our premiere. We sold at the theater and we raised a lot of money. I'm gonna get to how much money we raised soon, but specifically, our goal was to raise $20,000 to help end youth homelessness in Collingwood. Now, if you know anyone who is currently going through homelessness or going and struggling with homelessness in the area, please feel free to reach out to the Collingwood Youth Center or actually Caitlin, who was a wonderful help on the making of this documentary. Now, this was an hour and 45 minute documentary. I don't have the time to show you an hour and 45 minutes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a quick three minute clip featuring Lee Pankhurst right now. Feel free to let me know if I need to adjust the volume, if anything needs to be changed. 
So during the summer, um, I'm a camp director and uh, every Friday, kind of amazing way to finish off the week, we take the kids river trekking. It's very obvious, like when we're walking through, it's kind of very obvious that, that people or a person does sleep rough there. We are just um, at one point on the pretty river, just by the kind of bridge uh, that cars go across the kind of overpass. And the whirlpool is just sort of from us, we just passed that. Um, and we're just going down under to the underpass right now, um, which is somewhere where I've kind of witnessed um, the remnants of people sleeping rough. People have had like fires under here, and um, there's always like food, I've seen clothes, just real obvious signs of people of people sleeping rough. Obviously during the summer, like it's a little bit warmer and with the underpass, it would definitely offer that shelter from the elements, whether that, you know, that's rain or different things like that. But like I say, it's pretty clear to, to the eye um, that people, people sleep underneath here. Throughout however many summers I've kind of been going through there, um, there's always some sort of remnants of the fact that, you know, um, someone's been sleeping there, I've seen, you know, sleeping bags or, or clothes or, um, you know, kind of remnants of fires and different things like that. Yeah, so I mean, like right there, you've kind of got someone having a fire. They can kind of probably set a fire underneath here without it being too noticeable from the surrounding area. It's only really a trail and and the road that, um, that come past here, so there's no one really kind of seeing what's going on, especially at night. Ultimately, it's pretty secluded. You're not gonna get people coming down here at night. So realistically, there's, there's no one to kind of bother them. They can do their own thing. They're minding their own business. They're away from people. It's not something that's gonna cause anyone any bother. Um, not to promote it, but that would be kind of, I'm sure, the reasons why someone could stay here. someone sleeps rough under that bridge or people, multiple people, take shelter and take refuge during the summer. So that was no home in sight. Just a clip, obviously. But to expand more on it, we interviewed homeless youth from the community. People from Collingwood who have been going through homelessness for some a few months, others for a few years. We shared their personal stories and we sold out four showings at the Simcoe Street Theater in Collingwood. Now we set our expectations very, very high. We wanted to raise $20,000. When I was talking to Lee Pankers, when we were throwing around the idea for a fundraising goal, I suggested maybe we do $10,000, thinking that we might get half. He said, double that. Go to $20,000. Give it a shot. Who knows? After our showings in August of 2019, our sold out showings, we were happy to say that not only did we raise the amount of money we were looking for, but we surpassed it, thanks to Collingwood. And this is the impact that a youth, a young person, although I, I really, I don't look that young in that photo, I have a beard, I don't have a beard now, I almost look younger now than I do there, but I was 18, I had just graduated high school. I'd spent my whole grade 12 year working on this project. And we were able to raise $22,000 that directly helps youth. And that was because we took their stories, we took what was going on, and we brought it to the forefront. We showed people, and people care. Now, I'm showing you this next piece because I think it is very, very important to this story. It was an election year, it was 2019. There are multiple different candidates from the local area, some of which we actually interviewed in the documentary, talking to them about the issues of youth homelessness and homelessness in general in the Simcoe Gray area.
We asked them what they would do about it. And they spoke. But not only did we ask them, a few months later, Erica Engel of Collingwood Today asked them as well. And I'd like to direct your attention to one specific paragraph right here. So, and this is not a boast. This is not an attempt to pat myself on the back. This is just showing the impact that youth can have and that young people can have if they're passionate about telling a story. In an article that was read by, I don't even know how many people, but it was about, it was about an election. An election with candidates from all parties. The Calling the Youth Center, No Home in Sight, myself under the name JJ Cardillo Jr. Life isn't perfect, but we were referenced and I was quoted actually, because what we discovered when we were doing the film was there were far more homeless people than anyone really knew. So there's true impact that a young person can have on a community and specifically that I had. Now I'm gonna shift it away from me for, for just a moment. I'm gonna show you a, a photograph. Now this is a photograph by a photographer named Wolfgang Tillmans. He's German, he's very talented, and it's called Anti-Homelessness Device. Now, the difference between my documentary and a piece like this is this stands alone. The documentary gives context, gives interviews. It's an hour and 45 minutes. This is a photo that you can look at for 15 seconds. But what it says, I think is important. And what it shows is important. It shows life, it shows a situation. Now, you could assume, and you could rightfully assume, that the work of Wolfgang Tillmans might be socio-political in nature, might speak on homelessness, it might speak on these issues that happen in our community, in our society. You know, funny enough, homelessness in Collingwood wasn't just talked about by me, and homelessness in general wasn't just talked about by me, by, by I was the only high school student not mentioned here, but I'd like to, not shown here, but I'd like to mention was Leah Denbach, who was also a high school student who is a very talented photographer who did work with homeless people and released numerous photo books that are incredibly talented. So you could assume that perhaps Wolfgang Tillmans, and this is why I'm showing him to you, maybe that's why, that's why he's here. Maybe that's what he does, but it's not. Actually, this is an outlier because artists don't always need to speak explicitly about social issues to impact society. Now it can be within your work, it can be mentioned, but you as an individual, you come to that yourself. It's your work. Now, I'd like to show you Wolfgang Tillmans. This is him in mid fifties, I think he's 58 now. He's standing actually in a gallery of his work. He's had photography of his own shown all over the world, shown in the highest of museums and also in books available on newsstands. Now you see some of his work, I'm gonna show you specifically, because although I showed you anti-homelessness device, a great photo in my opinion, his work is very different to that. Not gritty, it speaks on individuals. It speaks on people. He's been working for over 30 years. He takes photos of people, of things, his abstract photography that makes you wonder how he did it. His photos are even famous. There are beautiful photos, touching even. Incredible work. Yet, what is, what is his meaning? Does he have a, a social meaning to his work? Is there something he's trying to say? Well, I wanna draw your attention specifically to one of those photos because it's important. And it's important on informing you on him, but not just that, informing you on how an artist can speak without saying a word. Now, this is the photo I'm gonna show you. It's from 1997, it was taken by Wolfgang Tillmans. Now, in the bath is his partner. It's in 1997. You would assume quite some time ago, maybe there are more photos, but this is, a photo that was taken the same year that the very man in the bath died. And he passed away 
from complications due to HIV AIDS. Something that Wolfgang Tillmans himself has been living with for the better part of 25 years and been aware of for nearly 40. So you can make the assumption maybe his work is about AIDS. Maybe there's something there. But in all of his work and every single piece he's done, there is one specifically and one even to my knowledge that even talks about it. And it's this, it's a photo of a box filled with prescription bottles. It's called 17 years supply. This is medicine to help him combat his illness. Now you, you can ask questions. You can wonder why maybe he doesn't put more of a focus on that and, and no one would blame you, but his work is his own. So speaking on HIV AIDS specifically, here's a quote from an interview with Tillman's. All my work has been made with the knowledge of possible death because since 1983, I've had an acute awareness of this disease, AIDS, affects me. In 1985, my first few sexual encounters when I was 17, I had this big AIDS fear. That's actually crazy when you think of a 17-year-old schoolboy lying in bed thinking he's going to die. The threat of AIDS has been with me all my sexual life. And so all the celebration and the joy and the lightness in my work has always taken place with that reality on board. The man interviewing him asks, in other words, if life is so fragile, one needs to celebrate and appreciate it more. And Tillman's gives a very, very interesting and very powerful answer. Yes, well, maybe that's too much of a statement. You could take away the if because life is fragile and you have to celebrate it and enjoy it and not despair over the fact that it's fragile because it just is. And that's why I don't despair. That's why I'm optimistic because it doesn't only affect, affect me, it affects us all. It just brings us all together again in the sense that that's part of the deal. We're all equally mortal. So my question is, Perhaps all of his work is truly about AIDS and truly about his living condition. It's just not said. So this is the question now I'm asking. I'm asking multiple. What can art say about you, the individual? If we look at Wolfgang Tillmans and the energy in his work, what can art say to others when it comes to youth homelessness, for instance? which also does relate to what can artists say about society because society deals with these issues that, you know, especially right now with COVID-19 that affect all of us. Maybe we don't even see it. Maybe we don't even know it. Homelessness, contagious disease, illness, a pandemic, it affects us all. But specifically when asking this question, when thinking about this and when speaking, I'm not just meaning to speak to you, someone who might be watching. I'm speaking to someone who might be an artist as well. Someone who might be passionate and who might be young, who might not know what to say and how to say it. So the question I raise is what can your art say? That's really important to me. That's incredibly important to the whole purpose of this. And I want to return back to this statement I said at the start. The world is just a fancy way of saying those around you because you can only impact those within your reach. Now, Tillman's, for example, has 30 years of work, has grown himself and built a name that people will pay money to see. Me, on the other hand, I was 18 when I put that together. I'm 20 now. I just tried plugging my magazine because I desperately want people to buy it because I think it's good. So you can tell, and I'm begging you to follow me on Instagram, you can tell there's a difference. But everyone has reach. And my reach in August of 2019 was Collingwood. So I want to elaborate on it. Because as your reach grows, so do those around you and your world becomes bigger, or if you wanna look at it, smaller. 
So it's really interesting to me to watch the growth of an artist and to watch how someone, how an individual can impact society, can impact others, and can truly make their mark and help people. Because I think truthfully, deep down, that's what art is about. Now, we're gonna move on a little bit and I'm gonna show you specifically one man. And if you remember the opening photo I showed, it was three people with goofy faces. And it's a man named JR, and it's not me. I'm John Cardillo Jr. I could uh, understand the confusion, but it's a, a French man named JR. Now, I actually first came upon his work, and he's a photographer and a street artist. I first came upon his work actually exactly where he's standing. For my 19th birthday, I decided that I wanted to drive to New York. And on two weeks notice, I reached out to my good friend, Emma, and I said, hey, do you wanna to go to New York? And she said, yes. So we went and on my birthday, I was able to go to the Brooklyn Museum. And there was a musician I really liked. Some of you might know him, his name is Most Def or Yasin Bey. He had an exhibit and I listened to his music and I saw the pieces, it was beautiful. When I stepped out the doors, I was greeted by this photo, this striking image on the wall. Now, there wasn't a French man who looked like he was about to fall over standing in front of it, but it struck me and I followed it and I looked and that's when I discovered JR. So I'd like to, to take you through some of JR's work and who he is because I think he is a perfect example of how you can change and how your reach can grow as you do. Now, I've done quite a bit of talking and I tend to talk and I tend to talk quickly. As anyone who knows me, especially Elaine, who's here watching, I can talk a lot. So I'm gonna take the time to step back because I put together, it's, a, it's about six minutes. It's a short video on JR actually. And I compiled footage from him talking about three different projects that he worked on. So we're going to go there now. Now, mind you, if there are any uh, audio issues, please let me know, but I think you'll enjoy. When I started, I actually, and that's a true story, find a camera in the subway. I was waiting for a friend. At some point I look on my left and there was a long bench and there was a bag there. And inside was this, you know, shitty camera with, you know, you couldn't change the lens or anything. Uh, you had to put films inside and two little battery. And, uh, you know, I remember I was like, trying to see if there was any sign from anyone. There was nothing, so I kept it. I remember the first film was actually a 12 pose, so I had only 12 shots, and I knew nothing about photography. I was going in the tunnels of Paris, on the rooftop, with my friends. Each trip was an excursion, it was an adventure. It was like leaving our mark on society, to say I was here, you know, on the top of a building. And a lot of the photos you're seeing here are actually from those 12 first frames. I changed school and they had a photo lab. And in that photo lab, I started printing those photos. And so I started just placing them in the street, you know? And then I started seeing all those empty walls in the city and I started pasting them with glue. So I used what I knew best, which is spray can, and I would frame them in red and then link every photo. Those were my first adventures discovering the city and then pasting them all over Paris. November 2005, the streets are burning. A large wave of riot had broken in the first projects of Paris. Everyone was glued to the TV, watching disturbing, frightening images taken from the edge of the neighborhood. And it was really this moment where in the media you would see some youths burning cars and breaking everything with hoodies on and, you know, hiding their face. And I realized that in the neighborhood, a lot of the youth I knew and a lot of my friends were not part of the riots. They were just trying to keep a normal life. The pressure of having the media trying to film the neighborhood from a distance with really long lens and people really feeling like they're being observed like animals. And I remember at that time, the only lens I had was a 28 millimeter. 
So to take a photo, I had to be really close from the person, that close. With that lens, you have to be as close as 10 inch from the person. So you can do it only with their trust. And so I photographed people from that neighborhood playing on their own caricature on how the people from Paris would see them. I started pasting illegally all over Paris, big portraits, because now I knew how to paste bigger size, and seeing the reactions of the people who suddenly could walk by a portrait and read the legend, the, the credit down the photo that would give the name, the age, the building number. So you go from an image in the media of someone you can't recognize that create that fear to someone you can actually go and knock at his door. A year later, I was listening to all the noise about the Middle East conflict. I mean, at that time, trust me, they were only referring to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So with my friend Marco, we decided to go there. And as a French, I can actually go on either side and it's something that the locals can't do. The idea of the project is really simple. It's to put people face to face, but people that, have, that do the same job. Taxi driver, lawyer, cooks. I ask them to make a face as a sign of commitment. Not a smile that really doesn't tell about who you are and what you feel. They all accepted to be pasted next to the other. I decided to paste in eight Israeli and Palestinian cities. And on both sides of the wall, we launched the biggest illegal art exhibition ever. We call the project Face to Face. Very quickly, because people have never seen an installation like that, people start, you know, stop in the street and like, very quickly you have a big group of people looking at. Then one guy, of course, is going to ask the question, excuse me, who, is, who, is those, who are those people? Oh, they're two taxi drivers. Oh, okay, okay, but why two taxi drivers? And I would say, well, because one is Israeli and one is Palestinian. And I could see they were confused because they were looking, okay, shit, which one is which? And I would ask them and say, okay, so who is who? And often they would get it wrong. They would say, oh, that's my brother, I can't recognize him. That's the Palestinian, or that's the Israeli. And I was like, ah, oh, no, the other one, but it's okay. Try on those guys, or try on those ones. And each time the people would say, well, we're pasting it here, but where else are you going to paste them? I say, oh, I, I want to go on the other side and paste it. Oh, no, over there, forget it. They never let you do this. Here we're open-minded, but on the other side, they never let you do it. And the same thing would happen when we'd go on the other side. The people would help us, give us the wall, give us a ladder, help us with the pasting, and even help us, you know, like uh, uh, convincing the other neighbors. And the interesting thing there is that it was the easiest project. Even if from the outside it looked very complicated, the only thing that was a bit more complicated was pasting the wall. But we just went there with no authorization, put the ladder on, and started pasting. And that was the only place where we kind of regrouped all the portraits together. You know, the pasting would last 30 minutes, one hour, who knows. Then I would be gone. But the guy who gave me his wall would have to talk about it every day. Because people would come and say, hey, well, well, why do you have those two portraits on the side? And then he would have to explain the whole story. So a year later, I came back to bring them a book uh, that we had made, and I gave it to everyone. And I came back to our stories. And all the people like, told me that what it created was much more conversations. But there was no hate. There was no insult. There was no threats. Face to face demonstrated that what we thought impossible was possible. And you know what? Even easy. We didn't push the limit, we just showed that they were further than anyone thought. So, that is the career arc, you could say, the, the three projects I chose of JR's. Now I'm gonna start showing you some other photos, but first I actually just wanna go back a little bit. Now, we're gonna go back and we're actually gonna stop right here because I think this is a perfect way to encapsulate what an individual's impact can be. Now he started, he was 15 years old when he was going around spray painting. And as he went through high school and funny enough, well, he was 17 years old in, I believe it was his 12th year at, at high school. He started taking those photos and he pasted them, he pasted them all over and he spray painted because that was his way of showing his work. He couldn't get into a museum, so all he had was what was within his reach. So he showed it off 
on street corners. And then as time moved on and as he kept doing it and as life happened, there was a huge riot, a political uprising, somewhat, sort of. Um, I'm simplifying it a lot. There's a great film called Les Miserables, um, which is actually uh, directed by a friend of JR's, the man holding what uh, appeared to be a gun, which is actually a video camera, directed the film. And it was, uh, I believe, a nomination for best uh, foreign language film at the Oscars in 2019. It's a great film that talks about this whole thing. But specifically, he saw this happening and he saw people he knew being made up to be monsters and animals. So he went to them and he had his short lens. He had to get very, very close. And while all journalists and, and uh, news reporters stood far away, he went up and he shook people's hands and he took their photos and he laughed with them and he pasted them all over Paris so that people could see truthfully the faces of those people that were being portrayed as monsters, as looters, as rioters. It was just in front of their face. That was his impact as an artist and as an individual. But that was his impact within where he could reach, which happened to be Paris. But he realized that as his art grew, I don't mean to be completely retelling this, but as his art grew, he decided he'd go to somewhere that he felt was going through something similar. And there was a conflict in Gaza around this time. And he went and he took those photos and he pasted them everywhere. And that was one of his major huge projects, which as he said, was the largest illegal art exhibition in the world. But he grew, he grew because his reach grew. And now JR's work, well, here's Times Square taken over by portraits he took. Here's the Louvre in France. The major art building, some might even say in the world. And he took it over and made the pyramid into something special. Beautiful art because he was able to expand his reach. This is the border wall between Mexico and the United States was put up after the 2016 election. This is a photo of a child from Mexico who was placed over the border wall, looking. His work isn't just in France, isn't just in you know, the Middle East, in that area, but it's made it to the US. This is the cover of Time Magazine. He did this project with them about gun violence and guns in America. On one side, you can see people who don't support guns and want, whether it's gun control, the ban on assault weapons, whatever it might be. But then you have on the other side, you have people who are pro-gun. You might have lobbyists. You also have individuals, individuals of every race, every background on both sides. What's special about this is it shows his, his growth that he was able to start as just a kid and make it all over the world. And specifically, recently, he made it to Egypt. This is a piece that I believe went up a few months ago, maybe even a few weeks ago in Egypt. And it's his work. And obviously his work has grown and it's changed and it's evolved, but it started off as a teenager who found a camera on the subway and started messing around taking photos. And he printed those out and he put those up. So again, the world is just a fancy way of saying those around you. It's those people that, that you're able to surround yourself with, that you do surround yourself with. And as you grow, your reach grows, and the world gets closer. So I'd now just like to take this time to talk about the Collingwood Youth Center, because 
it's wonderful for me to be able to say that I did this. I was able to make a documentary and, and uh, I was able to be successful. And obviously I'm showing you two other photographers, two other artists that were successful. And by no means am I comparing myself directly to them. But I'm saying that everyone starts somewhere and that an artist is malleable. It can change. But it needs to be given help. It's like a plant, it's like a flower. You have to water it, you have to nurture it. You have to make sure it has sunlight so it can truly grow and become what it is to become, so it can blossom. And for me, that was the Kong Media Center. And I know, I think right now that this is on a screen at the Kong Media Center. So hello uh, to everyone. I think I'm actually coming in later tonight um, to, to work because funny enough, I now work at the Colony Media Center. I was given the opportunity in 2018, in the fall, to work with the Youth Center because I sent Lee, who used to be my gym teacher, senior year, the film I had made. He watched it and he liked it. And he said, we have these cameras and we, I don't know how to use them. No one knows how to use them. Maybe you can. So I came in and myself, along with my friends, we looked at all these cameras and we thought, yeah, we can do something with this. We started filming, we started making things. We went with the idea we're gonna make a film. And that film turned into a documentary, but that only happened with the support of the Calling with Youth Center and with the support of Lee Pankers. And as a, as a specific place, as a spot, the Youth Center is fantastic for helping people but this area, Collingwood, is incredibly supportive. The youth center is just a blossoming of that. So as I said, I now work at the Collingwood Youth Center. No home in sight came out, I left school and I came back during COVID. And now I'm working there as a staff member and I work there most days of the week. And now I, Hopefully, I'm in the position that Lee was. We run a few different programs at the youth center. We have a youth council, which is actually meeting tomorrow night, that is designed to speak on youth issues so that young people can tell you in their own words what they feel is needed in our community. We have internships run with Alpha Bots, one that's a tech internship. And well, that's a culinary internship. But with the tech internship specifically, it's youth that are working on an independent project that they wanna have happen. We have some youth that are interested in making their own album of music, some that are interested in putting together a book of photography, others that are using our 3D printers, others that are using our podcast space and our shirt printer. Now, I know that this sounds like a pitch for the youth center, which in part it is, they pay me. But on the other end, this is also giving back. I was so fortunate to be able to put together a documentary that was incredibly successful. And I saw someone in the chat actually asked if this was still able to be viewed. Our goal is to make a new updated version, ideally, if we're able to, to check back in on the weekly interview. This is something that's been in the works and shop around for a while. But hopefully, I think it's something that can be done. So once that's released, we'll make sure everyone knows. But I was given the opportunity to do something incredible. And the Youth Center's logo was on it, but the Youth Center isn't speaking right now. I am because of what I was able to do. So we're giving back. And there's a lot of talented youth in our community who are incredibly interested and passionate about working on and making art and art that can impact people. I was someone who was so fortunate to have, as I like to say, the jetpack strapped to my back and I was sent to the moon. We're now doing this with young people so that there can be someone else who can sit here in a year, maybe two, and talk to you about what they did and how they're giving back because you can only impact those within your reach. And in this case, 
We have quite a few people in our reach. This is a project that we're actually working on now. It is, as you can tell, inspired by the work of JR. It is a mural. It's on the side of Fathom, right on First Street. It's 12 feet high and 60 feet long. And it features portraits of people here in Collingwood. I've been working on this for almost a year now with Caden Culver and Emma Thornwell, the two names that I had mentioned that worked on that magazine with me. We're putting this together and this mural will likely stay up for the next five to 10 years. This is something special. This is something showing Collingwood what and who makes it the wonderful, giving and kind place it is. If you're interested in knowing more about that, feel free to reach out to myself or to Lee Pankhurst or to the Youth Center in general. I have all those at the end. But as an artist and as an individual, there's a lot that you can do to impact those around you and those within your reach. So I'd like to thank you all for the time that you've given me. If you'd like to see any of my work, it's featured at Collingwood Youth Center. Uh, oh, sorry, it's featured at johncardellajr.com. The magazine that I mentioned is available there. My Instagram, again, if you don't follow it, I'll be upset. You can see the Collingwood Youth Center at their website. And the work of Wolfgang Tillmans and JR are featured right there. That's all I have to say. So I know that uh, we had talked about uh, opening this up to questions. Uh, if anyone is interested in asking a question, um, I'm not really sure how this is going to work. Uh, I can stop sharing my screen, but uh, I'd like to thank you all for the time and just remind you that it's whatever is within your reach. Thanks, so. John. That's wonderful. Do we, can we just clarify? So no home in sight, is it streaming anywhere right now or is it on YouTube or is it just, um, just on like, there's not somewhere that it could be accessed for anybody who wants to watch it right now? So as of right now, No Home in Sight is, uh, it's sitting on um, with us, basically. Okay. Um, we're kind of going to be polishing it up. Uh, for those of you that weren't at the uh, premiere, it was kind of a, a rush to get it done. Um, and there was a yeah. lot of, uh, of footage that didn't actually make the cut. So we, uh, we talked about uh, putting something together to kind of make a, a, a you know, redux, a new version. Um, more updated. And I think that's something that uh, uh, the timing might work to do that. Wonderful. Okay, cool. Good to know. So we can just kind of wait and see if there's more info on that later. Yeah, but if uh, if there's anyone interested, um, I know that we have shown it at, uh, I think it went to some high schools, mm -hmm. uh, went to some universities. Um, the film was shown in the Collingwood Hospital, um, some churches, I believe. So if there's interest in, in doing a showing, um, that's more than, than available and accessible. It's just not publicly um, available on like YouTube or anything right now. Okay, I think that, yeah, I think that probably answers your question. I think it was Ava that asked that. Does anyone else have any questions we wanna ask John before we wrap up and say thank you for everybody? I'll just wait one second and see if anybody else pops in. We had a few people show up late. Thank you for coming. Even though you were a little bit behind, we do appreciate you being here. And anybody who missed the beginning, everything has been uh, streamed on Facebook. And we will also be uploading this to the Collingwood Public Library's YouTube channel. So anyone who just kind of caught the end but would like to see the beginning can, uh, can view it that way. Um, if that's everything, I just also want to thank uh, Fifth Street for helping um, make this whole thing possible. And also mention again that the talk from Dave Meslin that took place uh, two weeks ago is also available on the YouTube channel in the Literacy Live series on on our website. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody.